Well, good morning to you. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. I'm going to run through the bulletin real quick. If you look at the back of your bulletin, you'll see that we're getting into Leviticus with our our uh, church family Bible reading, and so you'll get to read through there and say, how in the world can anyone keep all of these laws? And the answer is, we can't. We need a savior. And so keep that in mind as you uh, start there in Leviticus. You see this week that uh, Friday is the VBS prep prep time, and uh, if you open up your bulletin, you'll see that there's more information there under the SunQuest Rainforest area, and also some items that that you can uh, begin to collect and uh, contribute, if you would, and so that will be, um, that'll be appreciated, and also if you uh, would like to be involved with uh, being one of the leaders, one of the helpers, um, Cassie and her team would be thrilled to, to talk with you. And Joe uh, has an announcement for us on the next item there on your bulletin as you come down, and he comes bearing props. What? <laughs> Did I say there was going to be a trophy involved? Um, we have the uh, annual Calvary bowling outing coming up Saturday, April 20th. Uh, from 11.30 to around 1.30. Uh, how, many, how many outings are you aware of where the cost actually went down? Uh, last year it was $14. This year it is $12 per person. Includes your bowling, uh, shoe rental, pizza, and soda. And so we'd love to have you down, join us on the 20th. It's a family-friendly outing. We've got about three or four families already signed up, but we've got plenty of room for you all. So we hope you can join us on the 20th for uh, the family bowling outing sponsored by Men's Ministry. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next announcement there is about the visitation team. And Pastor Falk came back. I'm, I'm glad you came back. Because, because last week we said a lot, it's okay because Pat's going to, he's He's retiring from being the family minister's pastor, but he's still going to be here. So even if you're planning to be gone next Sunday, I'm glad you came this Sunday, just so that it'd be like, well, that's what they said, and then the next week he wasn't here. So anyway, Pat Falk, uh, if you would be interested in uh, helping with visitation, that would be delightful, and he is the point man for that. In the At Calvary... Uh, for this coming Saturday, uh, I draw your attention to that because this coming Saturday is the Iwana Games out in Union Grove and information there and encouragement to participate in that, not as a running arounder, but as one who's there cheering and uh, encouraging our leaders and our students who are involved there. So our scriptural call to worship comes from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, though it may not seem this way, you offer us here such a, such a freeing message to be concerned for others, to tear our gaze away from ever being on ourselves, but instead to care for others just as 
Christ lovingly did so, and for which we are eternally grateful, as he did not seek that which was for his own benefit, but for the benefit of all who would trust in him, having accomplished our salvation through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, as we now celebrate the hope that we have in him. So we thank you very much for for this invitation away from ourselves. And may we engage well with that as we have gathered here to worship you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
<clears throat> Please turn in your supplement hymn books to hymn number 49. Who is on the Lord's side? Hymn number 49. If you're able, please stand as we sing this and remain standing for the scripture immediately following. take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Luke 14, beginning with verse 25. You can find this on the, in the Pew Bible on page 552. Luke 14, 25 through 33. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it, seek it, who see it begin to mock and saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence through the merits of the Lord Jesus and worship you today, you who are worthy of all worship and praise. Lord, may we give as your disciples the very, our very lives for you and all that we possess because we want to be your disciples indeed. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
you can take a look in your bulletins, you'll find uh, it's, it's actually on the uh, other side of page one, on numbered pages, but you know what I mean. And you'll find the words to uh, two songs that we'd like to sing together at this time, beginning with Just As I Am, I Come Broken, and Change My Heart, O oh God. Would you please stand and join us as we sing?
Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. I thank you that the very fact that we can speak to you is an acknowledgement that, that you have not forsaken us, that you hear us when we pray. You do so for your own great name's sake. And we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. We pray that we would be faithful to pray for those we, we know who are unsaved, for those who are hurting, for those who are waiting, for those who are in the midst of hardship and suffering. May we be faithful to uphold them in prayer and pray for them that, uh, that they would see your good hand, that they would conduct themselves in a right way in the midst of their difficulty, that they would fear you and even in the midst of their, of their trouble, in the midst of discomfort, in the midst of uh, being limited in what they can do, I pray that they would be uh, desiring to be serving. And we thank you. Um, we thank you that in prayer we can turn our eyes to you and may we do so remembering the good things that you have done for us. May it cause us to be a thankful people for those in the midst of trials. May we not forget that you are good to your people and you have done uh, much good for us and may we bring that to mind and thank you for your good hand in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please turn in your supplement hymn books to number 33. May the mind of Christ my Savior. And uh, we'll, I'll ask you if, you if you're able to stand to sing this and uh, remain standing for the scripture following.
please take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to James chapter 1. And we will be reading verses 26 through 2 and verse 4. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of your Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in this good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here by my footstool, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the time that we have now to be in your word. There is there's so much noise in our life. There's so much noise, our, our ears are ever filled with noise and we don't need to hear more noise and certainly not from me. We need to hear from you. We ask that you teach us from your word, that you'd help us to understand it. We ask that you would do a work in our heart for the sake of your name. And we even ask in faith that you would would do a work in our wills to cause us to be cooperative participants in this process. We approach you and and ask you these things because of Jesus Christ, and we, we pray in his name. Amen. I have been particularly troubled with this week's passage, not necessarily because of what it says, but more so in how we are prone to interpret its meaning and in the process be misled entirely, and I'll even say not just a few of us. I very much appreciated the the music this morning. Uh, I was kind of writing back and forth with Bonnie this week. Just, you, you have these hymns that are sort of saying, this is who God is, and then you have these hymns that, that say, this is what I'm doing. And, and we can kind of sort of straddle the line a little bit, saying, this is what I aspire to do, versus just flat out saying things that are not true, which you can... I mean, I have sung the song, Man, I Feel Like a Woman, and that's not true. And so there are all sorts of things that we will sing, things that are not true. And and so as we come to this, I I, I was very much appreciating the music, Bonnie, and, and I found it interesting that for this subject, you tapped into the uh, supplement into the old hymnal for these things. Are these things going out of, are, are they not in vogue anymore, these things that we're talking about? 
In our recent study, uh, as Jesus Christ was approaching the cross, we looked at the desire for what I called a crossless Christianity, a Christianity without the cross. A crossless Christianity, which is to say the desire to gain the desired outcomes, the desired outcomes of forgiveness of sin, peace with God, meaning in life, but without the suffering. Maybe we can just receive the desired outcomes of of these benefits, but without the suffering. And Peter, for one, was sure there was a way, and he told his Lord as much. We see here in James what has been for others and what could be for you and what could be for me if presumptuously left unchecked is a polite, unknowing deviation, departure from the Christian faith of the Bible. So much so to the point of us adopting a so-called Christless Christianity. The danger of desiring a Christianity that doesn't have the cross and even going so far as to have a Christianity that is without Christ himself, which is to claim the blessed outgrowth, what what is produced, to claim the blessed outgrowth but forsake the root, maybe even capital R root. To take from Christianity the outworking of the faith, but to leave Christ himself out of the mix. And this is what is particularly alarming to me, is that a crossless Christianity and a Christless Christianity fit together frighteningly well. I'm troubled Because reading these verses that Howard just read to us, they speak about caring for orphans and widows and dignifying the poor. And it's all so nice. It's all so nice. And it's not just that I think it's nice because I'm a Christian, but it's that most people would regard such things as honorable, laudable, and would like for such things to be said of them. So where's, where's the difference? Is there even a distinction? If you were to ask the average person today and say, if you were to die today and stand before God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Most will construct a rather compelling list in ways in which they've been nice. And the list will be even more impressive if no one they know is there to corroborate the statements they make about themselves. Most will say, you know, I think I was a good person. Because I I tried hard. I tried hard to do more good things than bad, and I I think I succeeded in that. They might even say, "I, I, I cared for orphans and widows and the poor. In short, I did my best to be nice. And this is what I expect will get me through the door. God is nice, I was nice, we're going to be like two peas in a pod. In fact, it's quite conceivable and actually quite common to view these verses as a ways to be a good person. Here are the the how-tos of moralism. Do the following. Be nice. 
Where's my son? After all, is, isn't that our goal as people? To be known as nice? Indeed, the example I just gave is, is typical. It's not far-fetched. And so we have eternal stock in the idea if we think that we get into heaven based upon our niceness. Is, is it not the goal of Christians to be nice, I will caution us in our age of increasing nastiness toward one another that uh, spitting into the wind and, uh, and what not that we do there, we certainly are not permitted to be the opposite of nice. But as the goal of Christians just to be nice, isn't that our goal for our children, that they grow up to be Nice people, good boys and girls, well-behaved, good citizens. I mean, hopefully they'll stay in church, but at, at least that they'll think that they're good with God in whatever way they decide. Is our goal just to have a family that makes good pictures to hang on our wall? Now, these are good, and these are understandable desires. I mean, we would much rather them not be scoundrels. I understand that. But fresh, of our, fresh off of our messages on assuming, is that what we find here in James? Is this where James is going? And the answer is no. Because if that were the case, this Christian faith thing is just one of the many ways to be nice. We, we just set up God as a nice checker up there in, in the sky who sees whether we've been naughty or nice. And Jesus Christ is just the nicest example of niceness. And so following him is a good means of becoming nice ourselves. You did notice that this sign was up for all this gobbledygook? Thank you, Baba. I wanted to be clear about this because, because in putting this sign up here, we, we almost need this cue because there are aspects about what I was just saying that we'd be inclined to, to say amen about being nice. I know we wouldn't say amen. But if something really moved us, we might nod our head. I myself have even been moved to the point of uh, giving a momentary appreciative hmm. Only from time to time. But what I described of this underlying goal of being nice is quite an accurate representation of our practice, and inadvertently or not, it directs our mind and it directs the way that we feel about things in life. And our niceness tends to deceive us. It deceives us into thinking, what? That we are better than we are and that our need of a savior is less than it is. Establishing this substitutionary standard of niceness deceives us into thinking we are better than we are and that our Savior is less, our need of a Savior is less than it is. And if you would say that you're not convinced that our faith is prone to being rife with substitutions, allow me to press the point further, and you say, I really wish you wouldn't, and I respond, this is what I do, because this is what James does. James makes a point, and he continues to drive it home, and continues to explore the different facets of its application. 
rather than simply moving on like we kind of wish he would. Substitutions for your fourth X there. Substitutions were the practice of the scribes and Pharisees. You know the scribes and Pharisees, the Sadducees, you, you know all those you know all those religious people over oh, over there, right? Substitutions to strive to get everything together on the outside. Externals to get everything together on the outside. And this is rather gratifying for the self-reliant, for the self-sufficient, those who would like to establish their own righteousness in themselves. But Jesus Christ diagnosed them to be whitewashed tombs. For that bypasses the real need, which is the essential transformation of the heart. And this concept is throughout Scripture. You see in your notes that there's a lot of references there. That's to make the point, uh, even if you, if you space out and you're wondering where I'm getting this, it's so that you can look back in your notes and it's there. It's to make the point that this is very much throughout Scripture. When confessing his sin in Psalm 51, Dave, uh, King David succinctly stated about God, you desire truth in the inward parts. James has told us that our inward parts are where sin originates in chapter 1, verse 14. 3 John, verse 3, expresses what should be the heart's desire for the believer, for those under their care. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Jesus Christ himself declared this purpose statement for his earthly ministry in Luke 18, 37. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of the truth hears my voice. And it all comes together with this summary statement found in John 14, 6 where Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is to say, there are no substitutions. Therefore, Jesus Christ is not a peripheral element of this life. He is not an optional add-on. But he is, in fact, the central hub the question is not, how nice is nice enough? The question is not, am I nice enough? But the question is, what have I done with Jesus Christ? Have I accepted him? Have I received him or have I rejected him in favor of my own perceived goodness? As we return to our study in James, we can find that statements which are often repeated can begin to blend into the wall. It's sort of like when, you're, when your parents have these sayings and they get like two words into the saying and you know what the rest of, their, of the statement's going to be. And, and because it's familiar, it just sort of, it just blends into the wall. And as we're reading, our eyes can kind of skim over the top rather than allowing them to command, to grab our collar and say, hey, pay attention to this, and to continually redirect our attention. We see that James has faithfully directed his reader's attention again and again, and we've seen so again this morning. To what? James 1, verse 2, my brethren, verse 9, brother, 16, my beloved brethren. 19, my beloved brethren. Continuing in James 2, verse 1, my brethren. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, 
Listen, my beloved brethren. About which does all of this brother talk center? Brethren in Jesus Christ, it's centering on the Christian faith. That's what James chapter 2 verse 1 mentions specifically. Jesus Christ at the center. He is the hub on which our faith depends and subsists. He is the fundamental root of it all. And the faith is nothing apart from Jesus Christ. Our fellowship with one another is on the basis of our shared relationship with God through Jesus Christ, not through our shared niceness. James is not calling his fellow believers to externals. He's not calling them to be nice. He's not calling them to, let's put up this facade to, uh, you know, to, to, to market the brand. There, there are faiths that do that. They want to put on this face that makes their form of religion the best. No. James is calling his believers to wholeness. He's calling them to wholeness for the salvation that has been applied to those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and have therefore been adopted into God's family. And because of that, they are rightly brethren in Christ. For that internal change to be evidenced externally, that's James's desire, but not one without the other. He doesn't just want the externals, but to skip the internal change, nor, as we'll see, nor does he say, hey, you have that going on internally, you don't have to worry about showing it on the outside. Not so. But to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, as James wrote in 121, that the reality within would grow its way out. This is what James 1.18 addresses, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, committed to God, displaying what he is like, drawing attention to him because we are his workmanship, and resisting the tendency to insert substitutions which bypass my soul's eternal need rather than dealing with the sin and seeking forgiveness, which can only be accomplished through faith in Christ alone. Such substitutions deceive us with thinking the well-intended outward pageantries is enough, that externals will suffice, that what I show my mom is going to be good enough and... God's going to be likewise fooled. But external niceties fuel self-righteousness, and they bolster our natural tendencies to get wrapped up in temporal things, one of which includes comparing the whiteness of our tombs if we remove Christ. In a letter like James, which is known for its practicality, it's known for its relatable subjects and these scenarios that really stick out and make sense, history shows and it continues to show how its perceived message has been manipulated to promote a self-righteousness of works. But this is the very thing which the Apostle Paul was diligent to avoid. He wrote in Philippians 3, Considering all of these things that could be regarded as gain for his own personal righteousness account, what did he do with those? These things he counted as dung. Lest he look at those with reliance, whereby he might wrongly reason that these things will make him acceptable to God. So he cast such things away 
he devalued such things because otherwise these things are going to trip me up. I'm going to have a tendency to come back and say, God, I'm so nice. You have to like me on the basis of my niceness. He cast away such things that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God and by faith. Here in this letter from James, we are confronted with this same restless battle that he describes. It's a battle that goes, in, goes on within each one of us. I say that it's a battle, but it may be one, it may be a battle in which you are actively engaged, where you are diligently swimming against the current, or it may be that you have surrendered in the battle. It may be that you didn't even know it was a battle. It could very well be that you looked around at most of the people and have simply followed suit, which I would dare say that the majority functionally have given up. They've rolled over, preferring the ease of assimilation. And such things are evident in the American church as they have always been in other places. But there is a, a tendency to dilute the saltiness of the faith into agreeable, socially accepted niceties. And that's what concerns me when I come to the end of James 1 and going into James 2. Because it's easier to just go with the flow. Fitting in will be what is natural to us. Therefore, it will be broadly practiced, but it will be broadly practiced by those saved and unsaved alike, and therefore widely acceptable, quite palatable, and therefore seemingly a win-win. The popularity of this approach will convince us that we are reaching people. The Bible refers to this way of thinking, to these appeals, to this pattern of life as the world. And once again, we are contending with another matter of the heart, dealing with the way we think, feel, and act, with each element influencing the other and ultimately directing one's heart toward one thing or another. This is, what I was, this is what I was thinking when I was singing these songs. I was like, wow, wow, we are singing a lot here. A and I hope that these things that, that, we, that we sing don't just go into the category of I'm doing my nice churchy thing, where it sure is nice when people sing and so I'm, I'm just going to blah, 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 and sing along. We may reason that, that these things that, if we're honest, have a hold of our heart, we may reason that it's not compromise, it's simply a reality of living in the world. But we cannot explain away what is, that that is specifically the problematic tendency the Apostle Paul addresses in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I, I, I mention this again. I know we talk about it a lot. But I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that, that is set apart. James talks about there, that there at the end of chapter 1. That, that which God accepts. Acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I know that we've studied this before. But if you would allow me to remind you that our tendency is to become secular. Our tendency is to become secular. For the world to rub off on us more than we rub off on the world. Sure, I may spend five minutes in the Bible, but the remaining 1,435 minutes are spent in the world. And our history as a people have, has steadily moved in the direction of becoming increasingly secular, save for the times of revival. Biblical history shows us that has been the cyclical pattern of God's people. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And, and this is a very common thing for us to, I mean, I, I, I think about the mindlessness that can be wrapped up even in singing. That we could sing, man, I feel like a woman. And not even think about the fact that like, except I don't. But, it, but we can just, I mean, Bonnie, we've talked about this. It, it, singing lies is perhaps the easiest lies to tell. And we can get wrapped up in the emotion of things and, and talk about how much we love God. <clears throat> but Jesus Christ said, if you love me, do what I say. Uh, in fact, you don't even need, you don't even need to say it. You, you can, you'll just show it when you obey. And, and that's uncomfortable for us, and, and it's going to make us tend to want to put in a substitution here. According to Romans 12, I am to be a distinct reflection of God and his work in me rather than mimicking the world. At the end of James 1, we read, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father. Before God and the Father. So this is not judged off of my own rationalization, nor is it based off of the standards which are determined by the world, but what the holy, righteous God regards and what he outlines. And what's included there is keeping oneself unspotted from the world. Jesus Christ himself judged it impossible to serve two masters, saying you will either hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. One will always win out. This is agape love that is spoken of here, a love that sacrifices self, that prefers the other, that will win out time and time again. Therefore, you can't have it both ways. You can't love God and mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. Between God and, worth and worldly wealth, it will firmly land on one side or the other. And so goes our heart, commanding how we think, and that forms the lens through which we view the world. And it commands what we desire and how we feel about the world, resulting in the life that is observed through our conduct. So again, these matters of the heart. Understanding this reality, we would be helped to deal with 1 John 2, 15 through 17. If you want, you can turn there. But in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world. That's the same word used in Matthew 26, or, uh, 6, 24. Agape, a self-sacrificing, self-surrendering love. Do not give yourself up to the world. 
Do not love the things of the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to ask for a show of hands, but I assume that most of us will not argue with James as to whether or not this is true. Instead, we will be inclined toward the more common Christian response. I call it the yeah, but. Which is to say, yeah, I agree with that, but here's why I don't think it's true. Here is why it doesn't apply to my situation. Here is the qualifier that actually affirms what I've decided to do. But why is it that we feel the need to yeah, but John's statement? And I figure, if you're anything like me, it comes from a desire to allow ourselves a little bit of space. You know, where I can uh, exercise some, I don't know, some artistic license in how this gets applied. But this likely hits close to home because the world is a substantial part of our life. And we would rather not have that messed with because when it comes down to it, worldliness is rather accepted. Holiness is comparatively hated. That, that's what Pharisees are, those goody-goodies. I heard it said, we tend to be happy with God's commands until it costs us something. Until it means that I give up something. And it's at that point where we decide which we love. To which we will give ourselves. For what we will sacrifice ourselves what we're going to stick with and what we're going to part with. And this is a tough pill, but the young people you hear about leaving the church in their college years, it's likely more than leaving the church, but actually leaving the faith. As the thorns of the pleasures and appeal, the appeals of life, they, they grow up and they choke out and they win out, the thorns do. The rest of the trees in the garden looked good until Satan came along and said, really? Just that one tree? And all of a sudden, just that one tree was the option, the unknown, to be experienced, maybe even to be enjoyed. At which point, we determine whether we love God or mammon. And again, this is a difficult thing because we are an entertainment entrenched culture. And most of us drink from that well daily, many of us hourly, continually. Music, shows, movies most all of what shows up on our screens and the fashion, money, and pursuits that go with it. So it's a big piece of the pie when it comes to the amount of time and attention we give such things. And not surprisingly, it is therefore a commanding force in the direction of our lives. And it's a major incentive to compartmentalize our Christianity that it's just this contained category of life. But John kindly brings to our attention the reality that life is not an either-or, or that it is, it is an either-or, not a both-and. Life is an either-or. It's either this or that. It's not a both-and. You can't have it all. And you cannot have it both ways. 
But the Apostle John goes on and explains that the two camps actually don't have tons in common. They are not simply telling different aspects of the same truths. They are, in fact, entirely incongruent. They are not in agreement, but opposed. And James goes on to describe, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Using the word lust is rather pointed. It's to have a craving. It's to have a consuming desire. Not always bad, but in this context, it's to have a consuming desire for what the flesh desires. The thought of, I have a yearning, I should be able to act on it. Self-restraint is prudish. It's confining. It's opposed to my flourishing. What my eyes see, I see it, I want it. I should be able to have it. None of those things are true, by the way. The pride of life, just this arrogant, baseless pride of drawing attention to ourselves, I should be able to have what I want. And seeking to gratify myself with whatever it is I have decided I want. But James kindly gives us the perspective and tells us that such things are temporal. They're here for a while and then gone. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but by contrast, he who does the will of God abides forever. This is a problem for each of us in one way or another. It's a problem for the people who were in the church at Corinth. They faced the temptation to pick and choose, to sep separate out and, and substitute as they pleased with their faith. And Paul writes, in, uh, writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he talks to them about how to conduct the Lord's Supper. And he writes, beginning in verse 17, Now in these instructions I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, when you come together as this gathered one, there are divisions among you. That, that doesn't work. And in part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry, another is drunk. So just demonstrating a, a selfish, gluttonous excess in the face of those present without anything to eat. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. He then gives the instructions, the words of institution, which we read each time we receive communion. After which Paul goes on to instruct us to examine ourselves in verse 28. So as to not eat and drink this in an unworthy manner. And he even goes on to explain how there are some who are sick and others who have died for being flippant about this. Because this was a set apart time and it was being treated as cheap and likewise it treated the Lord himself as cheap. To think that we could separate him from the Christian faith, that we could just substitute these things of our own liking and these things of our own comfort. And so, dear people, I'm, I'm stirred this morning. I hope you always know, today was an exception. Most of the time, I'm the chief of sinners. 
I just didn't take the time this morning to bring you into that. But we're talking about these are these are tendencies within our own heart. And so as the men who are helping serve this morning, if you'd come forward, may we approach our God humbly. Dear people, don't stay away. Don't stay away. Don't say, oh, I'm dirty. I need to stay away. No, that's the, that's the whole point. That, that's, that's why we need to come. Because we don't, we don't approach God in our own righteousness. But may we approach our God humbly and thoughtfully with this time. Y'all can sit. Thank you. It's a time to examine ourselves. It's a, a time to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal areas where we have welcomed the world to the exclusion of him. Time to confess sin and, and, and to repent and return to him, knowing that he will receive us. Nate, would you thank the Lord for his body? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this uh, command to remember uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and and that it is only through that that we have salvation. And, um, Lord, as we, um, as we lay aside the sins that uh, cling to us, that uh, we will be made more like Christ. Lord, we, it says that we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus looked forward with joy to uh, be our Savior, to take our sins upon him, and, and um, for that reason suffered the cross, and we remember that now. Grace in Jesus' name.
as I said, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we were looking before. Can I state the obvious here? Jesus Christ died for our sins. Why? Because we needed him to. And isn't this a freeing thing to acknowledge our need of a Savior? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do so together. Pat, would you thank the Lord for his blood? Father, we thank you that your word says that without the remission of the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And we know that through the blood of Christ, who was poured out which was poured out on the cross, we have remission or forgiveness, cleansing of sin. And we thank you for that, symbolized by the cup. In Jesus' name. <laughs> In the same manner, 
He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's do so together. And we'll sing together. This is a hymn that's been kicking around in my head all week. So uh, let's sing with uh, understanding. centering song to remind us of what we are to be about. I will remind you that our ushers on Communion Sunday will wait on you for benevolence offering. And if you would, uh, join with me in praying as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.